Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're gonna to be doing a quick video on H. pylori infection and could it be making you sick? We'll go over how H. pylori can be affecting your physiology, affecting your digestion, why there may be other issues with H. pylori and what you should do, at least as a starting point to kind of get going. All right, before we do, make sure you hit the like button, right? Make sure you smash the like button, helps the YouTube algorithm. Put your comments down below. If you have an H. pylori infection or you have addressed one in the past, put your comments down below. And then also make sure you uh, share with your friends and family. So what's H. pylori? Helicobacter pylori is a gram-negative bacterial infection, primarily lives in the stomach. It's got a helix shape, so it, it can kind of screw into the gut lining. It has the ability to take um, urea and turn it into urease via the urease enzyme. And that, or I should say, it, it takes the urease enzyme, which it makes, and it attacks urea, and then it makes CO2 and ammonia. CO2 gets caught on that H. pylori breath test. So we have H. pylori, we have urease, that hits the protein metabolite, urea, and that spits off ammonia and CO2. Ammonia is more alkaline, about 11 on the pH scale, so it actually can lower stomach acid levels, and it can create gas and bloating, especially with CO2. So part of the H. pylori breath testing will measure CO2, right? It's gonna be an indirect test. We have tests like the DNA tests that are more sensitive, more specific. We can also test on the DNA side virulence factors, VIRA, CAGA, OIPA, ISA. These are virulence factors, cytotoxic proteins produced by the H. pylori that make it stronger, make it more virulent, make it more likely to cause inflammation and problems and symptoms. Now, if you don't have a virulence factor, you could still have problems with H. pylori. But if you have virulence factors, it's more likely that there could be more inflammation caused by the H. pylori. So gram-negative bacteria can lower stomach acid. When stomach acid's lower, it, your body may make and activate less enzymes. So less enzyme activation, greater chance for indigestion, fermentation, putrefaction, rancidification, so poor digestion, more rotting, uh, and then this can create more issues because then now you have poor digestion, you can start to see inflammation in the gut lining, atrophic gastritis, so that gut lining gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and it can start to set you up for in, let's say, lack of biliary function because without enough good acidity, our gallbladder is not going to work making a whole bunch of bile. And without good acidity, we're not going to have a good pancreas making trypsin, chymotrypsin, lipase. So we're going to have insufficient pancreatic output, insufficient gallbladder output. Then we start having more bloating, more gas, more digestion issues, lack of digestion and absorption of minerals and nutrients and it can create functional deficiencies, meaning you have access to these nutrients, but you can't even get them into your system optimally to absorb it. So you can see how H. pylori can really be a domino that affects your whole entire digestive system with the stomach being affected first and the, it affecting the pancreas and, and bile and HCL and dysbiosis and fermentation and rotting of foods and then potentially exacerbating leaky gut, more gut permeability, more immune stress, and then we know how H. pylori can easily be connected to other autoimmune conditions, especially Hashimoto's, which I have and I manage myself naturally. So you can see, you gotta get to the root issue. Now, a lot of people that have H. pylori, they could have H. pylori and blasto or blastocystis hominis or candida overgrowth or Yersinia or Cryptosporidium or Giardia. So you could, or just general SIBO, general bacterial overgrowth. So it's very possible. So if you are kind of glommed on to the H. pylori being it, it may not be it. It could be other things. And the H. pylori may have created a lot of functional deficiencies. It may have created a lot of gut permeability issues. It may have stressed out your adrenals as well. So you have to look at the whole the whole picture. And a lot of people I've seen go in the conventional route. They may even get missed. So you need to test it via good quality DNA test. I use the, G, the DSL GI map. I'll put the link down below so you can access it. You can also do blood testing, IgG, IgM, IgA is great, but that may miss it too. And you can do the breath testing too. I'm a bigger fan of the DNA because the DNA is about two to 3,000 times more sensitive. I've even seen a lot of scopes where they take a sample out, even miss it. I've seen some people test positive and negative on the same sample, I've seen that before. So I'm always a little bit skeptical on the scopes. I always much rather do the more non-invasive testing. And then we can even look at inflammatory markers like calprotectin. Sometimes H. pylori can really increase gut inflammation because of its inflammatory virulent nature. So really important. Now, how we address it, it depends. But in my line, I have a product called GI Clear 2 that has some common, really good H. pylori killers in there, such as mastic or mastic gum, which is from an island in Greece. Also has bismuth in there, which is really great. 
It has clove in there, which is really good, and some berberines. These are all really good starting points to kind of help with the gut infection. I'll typically go with higher dose berberines. We'll go with um, we'll go with wild indigo in there. We'll even do some wormwood or some artemisia. Higher dose olive leaf can be really helpful. Stamona can be great. So there's different herbs that you can use. In my line, I have GI Clear 1 through 6, and I use a combination of these depending on what's going on because a lot of times it's H. pylori plus other infections, so we have to synergistically address everything kind of together. Hope that makes sense. So in my line, we work on the first six R's. So remove the bad foods, replace the enzymes and acids, second R. Repair the gut lining and the hormones, third R. Fourth R is remove the infections. That comes later in the game. Most people do this first. It's a big mistake. Fifth R, repopulate, re-inoculate good bacteria. Six R, retest. And the X factor could be pets and partners can easily give you H. pylori because it can be spread via saliva. So if your dog licks you in the face or um, just being just general sharing of silverware, cups with non-intimate partners, right? Kids, family, right? Friends, that could easily transfer it if your gut's weaker and you have poor IgA levels, you could easily get H. pylori via just saliva swapping. So pretty easy to get, especially when you're more on the um, immunocompromised side. Hope that helps, guys. If you're enjoying these videos, put your comments down below. If you want to reach out to myself and you want to get help with your H. pylori or other gut issues that could be at play, click down below to reach out and schedule with myself and or colleagues. All right, any questions, I'll open it up here briefly. Do you suggest taking HCL before or after the meal? I do it with the meal because people who have H. pylori and gut inflammation, they tend to be very raw. And the gut, the, H, the HCL, when it sits on a raw stomach, can be like giving a massage to someone with a sunburn. So having a little bit of food cushioning there really helps. How do you get H. pylori? I had it a few months ago. You could get it from four major reasons. Water, people, pets, or food. Those are the big vectors. And of course, if you're more immunocompromised, you have less IgA in your saliva or your gut membrane, then you're more likely to get it. And of course, people that have lower stomach acid, right? Low stomach acid means low pH. So a lot of times, lower, more stomach acid can make it harder for H. pylori to grow in the beginning. A lot of people talk about H. pylori they think, oh, well, it can cause ulcers. That means it has to create more acid. But no, H. pylori, what it does is it actually lowers stomach acid, but you can have acid from H. pylori from indigestion, right? If you don't digest food, that food rat, rots essentially in your body. It rots, it ferments, it recidifies, it putrefies. It can create acids from the rotting process, and those acids can actually be irritating. You've seen it over and over again. You'll see it online and such. People talk about, hey, I have this indigestion, this, this stomach issue, this bug. I take some apple cider vinegar. I thought it would make it worse because my stomach already felt raw and it actually made it feel better. Why is that? It's because there was typically poor digestion. The food wasn't being broken down adequately and that little bit of acid gave the digestive system a bump and it was able to break down that food better and stop a lot of that rotting and those organic acids being produced. Would you think H. pylori is a factor if there is light burping to hours after a meal or could it be fixed with just digestive enzymes or acids? So it could be just low enzymes or acids. You can always try that, see how you do. And if a lot of that improves, good. It could just be the food that you're, you're eating. It could also be too much water with your food because a lot of burping can be indigestion with the stomach. Too much water with food in your stomach. Water's got a pH of seven, right? If your stomach is a pH of two, that could raise the pH, make it more alkaline, which isn't good for digestion. Would you recommend ACV or HCL if there's possible LPR issues? So laryngeopharynx reflux is the issue. It just depends, right? So a lot of times LPR is known as silent reflux. So you just have to look and see what's going on. So most people that have tummy issues have low stomach acid and enzymes. The question is, can you add those things in without irritating the gut mucosa? That's the question. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. You can almost always add in enzymes. So you can almost always add in enzymes. If you're on the fence, you can play around with bitters and go from there. But if you have any acid irritation, definitely stop that because you could have an active ulcer and you don't want to throw acid on an active ulcer. We want more healing and soothing, maybe just enzymes and some gentle, gentle bitters to support digestion. So it just depends upon how well you do and how well you feel during the process. And if you think you have active ulcers at all, and you would know because even the smallest bit of acid may cause irritation, just don't do acid. Lean more on enzymes, really pre-digest and cook your food via digestion of, um, via Instapot, via Crock-Pot, via pre-digestion of heat, 
and then chew your food up really well and avoid a lot of water while you're eating your food. All right, guys, Dr. J here. Hope you enjoyed the content. You want to reach out to myself, link down below to reach out. I'm available worldwide. See patients. I've treated thousands, at least hundreds, if not thousands of H. pylori cases in my 10-year-plus career. Look forward to helping you. You guys have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Bye.